Okay, I think the uh, attendance is stabilized. I'm sure a few more people will join. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, to those who I do not know, I am Hal Stern. I'm the Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor here at the University of California, Irvine. And I'm really excited for my small role in today's activity. Um, I'm here to introduce uh, the panelists for this special Solutions That Scale uh, webinar. Uh, we're joined by uh, the leadership team at Southern California Gas. So uh, some very brief, hopefully brief introduction because I want them to have the bulk of the time. Um, I think uh, many people on the call know, but in case you don't, uh, less than a year ago, Southern California Gas, the largest gas utility in the United States, made a game-changing climate pledge to attain net zero gas utility by 2045 which is the same date that California law requires decarbonization of its electric grid. And Southern California Gas wants to build the cleanest, safest, and most innovative energy company in America, and I think they are uh, well on their way to doing so. Uh, in the past year or so since that announcement, they've done a number of things, releasing their Aspire 2045 strategic plan. Uh, in October, they released a uh, report, the role of clean fuels and gas infrastructure in achieving California's net zero climate goal. Two weeks ago, they announced the Angeles Link, and they're gonna talk about that here today, the country's largest hydrogen infrastructure project, large enough to decarbonize one quarter of the Los Angeles Basin gas supply. And they've sponsored a number of other applied research and demonstration projects from hydrogen blending to decarbonized steel production to hydrogen drones. Um, we're extremely excited that UC Irvine has been able to partner in a number of projects over the years uh, through, uh, through our um, team in the School of Engineering and really excited to welcome the Southern California Gas Team here today. Uh, the team is led by the president of Southern California Gas, Mayor Brown, who has a mechanical engineering and law degrees and shares leadership responsibilities for these efforts with an impressive team that includes Neil Maven, the Vice President for Clean Energy Innovations, and Yuri Friedman, Senior Director of Biz Business Development, who join her here today. Uh, everyone on our team that I've talked to and had an opportunity to meet with uh, Yuri and Miriam uh, 18 months ago, um, it, it incredibly uh, hold, hold the Southern California Gas team and their achievements in incredibly high regard and are uh, totally consistent with this group, the Solutions at Scale group, um, so, um, Miriam, thank you uh, so much for, for being here today um, and bringing your team with you, and we're really grateful for your time today. So, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, welcome to uh, UCI. Thank you very much, Vice Chancellor Stern. It means a great deal to um, have you here and introducing us to the Solutions That Scale panel. Um, and thank you very much for the introduction. SoCal Gas is very fortunate and grateful to partner with UCI on projects like Power to Gas that are going to be essential to the Angeles Link. And the work that you do across multiple disciplines inspires us. And I always look forward to events like this to be able to engage and co um, compare notes on what SoCal Gas is working on and the way UCI is, is looking at it. Um, before Yuri, Neil, and I get into the details of Angeles Link, and the, that green hydrogen infrastructure project that, that, that you talked about, Vice Chancellor, I'd like to take a moment and step back and, and really look at the big picture of where we think that this fits um, in, the, in the trajectory of energy and in the trajectory of innovation in history. Um, so throughout history, there have been several eras where science and engineering and mathematics and technology have taken great leaps forward. You're all familiar with Aristotle, and I'm going to come back to Aristotle and Archimedes and Pythagoras in ancient, in ancient Greece. Um, in ancient Persia, which is where my family lineage um, comes from, algebra was invented and windmills for grinding grain. And around the 11th century in China, we have the invention of paper currency and movable type and gunpowder and compass, which is essential to our lives today. And of course, there's the Renaissance. Um, the astrolabe allows ocean going navigation, blast furnaces, um, massively expanded iron production, and uh, linear perspectives from the art world helped us in engineering to be able to reflect things in three dimensions. 
And I think very much that today we are living in another great era of technological change, and that's in multiple areas. That's in communications, that's in medicine, and it is also very much so in energy. I think that the energy industry is going to see more change in the next 25 years than they've seen in the last 100. And we really need the academic community, all of you out there. The global energy transition needs the best, the brightest, and the most hardworking collaborating with people working to solve our problems. And it's really the caliber and the excellence of the people at UCI, which is why Neil and Yuri and everyone at SoCal Gas loves working with you. You have made us better, you have made us smarter, and the ripple effect of your investment collaborating with us matters because we're the largest gas utility in the Western Hemisphere and we thereby set a standard. So thank you very much for that investment in time that you have made with us over many years. Um, so let's address Angela's link and how that fits into this wave of technology and innovation. Angela's link, as the vice chancellor said, is SoCal Gas's proposal to build the country's largest green hydrogen infrastructure system, um, bringing green hydrogen produced in eastern parts of the state where the solar resource is rich and bringing it into the LA basin for use in electric generation, um, uh, heavy duty trucking, as well as manufacturing. And the Angeles link is very much a next step in SoCal Gas's goal to fulfill um, being net zero for greenhouse gas emissions in everything that we do. Net zero in our operations, net zero in the energy that powers our operations, and net zero in the energy that we deliver to our customers. And that's a very big deal because SoCal Gas serves 22 million customers across all of Southern California. Um, Angelus Link can make life better in California by cleaning the air. Um, we estimate that it can eliminate up to 3 million gallons of diesel fuel burned um, every day in heavy duty trucking. That's about a billion gallons a year. In that same scenario of decreasing diesel emissions, the Angelus Link could decarbonize four electric generating plants. In particular, um, we think there's the opportunity with LADWP, the large um, muni, for the city of Los Angeles and their natural gas power plant, converting those over to green hydrogen. And the Angeles Link could also decarbonize the hard to electrify manufacturing sector like steel and cement and glass and preserving those jobs that are associated with these industries and good jobs matter. Um, they pay college tuition for kids among other things, right? So most people don't know that um, the Los Angeles Basin is the largest manufacturing center in the country. And because of this manufacturing center and because of the heavy duty trucking and electric generation, as well as the two busiest ports in the country being located in the Los Angeles Basin, it makes it the perfect location for America's first green hydrogen hub. Overall, as the vice chancellor said, the Angeles Link would reduce about 25% of the volume of natural gas in our service territory today, and that is very significant. Um, we want to build the Angeles Link because in, from our vantage, we think that the best energy system in California combines the strength of, of clean, renewable energy from solar and from wind with the strengths of green hydrogen, as well as other clean fuels like renewable natural gas and, and, and others. And green hydrogen supports the addition of additional solar and wind into the energy system. We're going to need that additional solar and wind to charge electric vehicles because transportation is the single largest source of greenhouse gas emissions and our biggest opportunity really for greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the week after, we announced Angeles Link and our green hydrogen infrastructure proposal for Western states, Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, and Wyoming, um, announced their proposal for a similar system. And there are efforts for hydrogen hubs in, in other parts of the country, including Texas. And we're very excited that they're following our lead um, because the technology is proven. We have many, many miles of hydrogen pipelines operating in America now. So when we announced 
Angeles Link. Um, California's Governor Newsom pointed out that SoCal Gas is an energy infrastructure company positioned for the future, not a natural gas company. And SoCal Gas's 150 year history, we've changed fuels before and that's what it is that we're doing now. So what we need now are one, continued innovation from institutions like UCI, um, if we're gonna see projects like Angelus Link and others to be successful. And two, we also need policies that support green hydrogen, as well as other renewable gases and other clean fuels. And stakeholders need to come together um, in the adoption of these policies. And that's all stakeholders, especially the ones who have historically been ignored, like the freeways with the diesel trucks that run through their communities. I think it's important to remember that the clean energy system all of us are building is not a market-driven solution. It is a policy-driven solution. And there's a big difference between the two. And so policymakers need you. They need the academic community to help them understand the best way to build this energy system. They trust you. You are unbiased. Your dog in the fight is truth. And your horse in the running is a better society. Your voices in the energy conversation are essential. And I said I would come back to Aristotle. Um, and I, I want to make a last point on this, on the importance of academia's voice in shaping what the energy system of the future should be. Aristotle absolutely wrote on physics and biology and um, geology, but he also wrote on politics and economics and ethics. And today more than ever, scientists and engineers and technology experts must be counseling those in the halls of power because our civilization, we must make wise technology investments now to get where it is that we need to be. And I believe that we're gonna get there. Because remember, as humanity navigates the energy transition, never before in human history has so much of the world been united in a common cause and the common goal. And that common goal couldn't be more, better illustrated and more acute than what's happening right now in Ukraine. And I do think that it is important in the conversations we have about energy and the role of projects like Angelus Link. Vladimir Putin felt very confident in attacking Ukraine because he thought his, he had energy leverage over Europe. And now European nations are reconsidering where they get their energy from and moving faster on hydrogen and liquefied natural gas and other diversified energy projects. Clean, secure energy is the greatest single sort of progress against Putin's autocratic regime. And right now, other nations are ahead of the United States in hydrogen, and that needs to change. We need to challenge ourselves to be the global innovation center in hydrogen. We have to blaze that trail. And I think that the Angelus Link can help do that. And I think it can become a prototype, not just for California, but for the country and, and, and the world. And, um, and I really appreciate the opportunity and the engagement with UCI to help us to see Angelus Link to, um, to success. So with that, I'd love to turn it over to Neil and we have a slide deck to walk you through more of the details around Angelus Link. All right, thank you, Miriam. Um, and thank you, UCI, for hosting us. Uh, I'm gonna go through a few slides and then gonna pass it on to Yuri uh, Friedman. And then Miriam is gonna sort of wrap up our, our slide presentation at the end and then we'll go into questions. So again, uh, we really appreciate uh, your time today and thank you to UCI for hosting us. Um, so what, what is Angelus Link? Angelus Link is a, a, an infrastructure project that seeks to move green hydrogen. So uh, hydrogen uh, from uh, renewable sources uh, from the Eastern part of the state uh, into the LA basin. And as, as Miriam mentioned, uh, to those hard to abate segments of the economy, those things that are hard to electrify like heavy duty transportation, like in the industrial loads that we see in uh, the, the LA basin, and like the dispatchable power generation that we know will be needed to maintain a reliable and resilient electric grid. 
Uh, this is a project at scale. Uh, we are looking at uh, once the project is built uh, to its full capacity uh, and as it's currently envisioned, we are looking at gigawatts of uh, curtailed. So curtailed energy is energy that is currently not being used or is being sold to other states at negative prices. Um, so an overabundance of solar or wind. So harvesting that existing renewable resource, but also building new uh, renewable resources, new solar facilities, new wind facilities that could uh, both produce electricity, but also produce hydrogen in really significant quantities. The value of that hydrogen um, that would be produced through electrolysis, so the, the second box to the left, is that uh, hydrogen is a, an energy carrier that can be stored over time. Unlike electricity that needs to be produced and generally used at the same time, hydrogen is an energy carrier that can be stored for days or weeks or interseasonally, which is a really big challenge in a place like California where we have very high energy demands in the winter and in the summer when it gets hot. And, but during the shoulder seasons, we actually can have an overabundance of energy. Angelus Link, uh, the work that SoCal Gas uh, really intends to do to bring parties together is to look at what I'll call the interstitial elements. So how do we bring the uh, renewables uh, developers and those that would seek to produce hydrogen uh, and, and connect them with the off takers that are in the LA basin? So it would be the pipeline infrastructure, the interconnection with production and the compression and movement of hydrogen in a green hydrogen pipeline infrastructure system. And we be delivering that, uh, those molecules into those areas that have these very high industrial needs. So the ports of Los Angeles, the ports of Long Beach, the industrial heart of the city uh, and the region uh, to help displace uh, 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 natural gas and GHGs in those areas that are not uh, today viewed as being easily electrified. And if you look at the number on the right, you can see, and we will go to the next slide, that we're really talking about moving hydrogen at mass scale. And moving hydrogen at mass scale does a few things. One, it has a bigger impact to the ability, our ability to reduce GHGs. But it also has an, a, the ability for us to scale and reduce the cost of transportation. And transportation of, of hydrogen and, and energy in general uh, makes up a significant portion of the cost of delivering energy. In the case of hydrogen, it's somewhere around a third of the cost. So if you can deliver using uh, economies of scale, larger systems, you can both have a more significant THC impact, but you can also reduce the costs ultimately of, of moving the hydrogen. So on this slide, you'll see sort of one scenario for the use of that, of that hydrogen. And, and one of those scenarios is to look at uh, displacing natural gas in um, uh, the, our power sector. And in this case, it's looking at LADWP's power plants. The Los Angeles Department of Water and Power has made a very bold commitment to decarbonize their electric generation fleet. Uh, and part of the way they want to do that is with hydrogen. So we're substituting hydrogen for natural gas, first starting with a blend of natural gas and hydrogen, and then ultimately a system that would be using 100% hydrogen. And you can see if you displaced uh, though that GHG um, source, and use the rest of the hydrogen entirely in the transportation sector, so heavy duty transportation. As Mary mentioned, we could, we could uh, displace as much as 3 million gallons of diesel a day, a billion gallons of diesel a year, but also have significant air quality impacts by reducing NOx. And NOx, as you know, is a smog forming chemical that we have real challenges with in the LA basin. And the beauty of fuel cells. And the beauty of the work that uh, the fuel cell work that's done at places like UCI is that fuel cells do not combust, so they don't uh, they don't produce NOx. 
So this one project is really a significant opportunity to reduce GHGs as much as 14 million cubic meters, uh, metric tons, sorry, of CO2, but also uh, significant NOx and air quality benefits. And I'm gonna pass it uh, on to Yuri, who's gonna uh, continue to talk about um, uh, the other elements of the project. Uh, thank you, Neil, and thanks again to UCI for having the opportunity to discuss this project and continue our very fruitful and our very productive collaboration over the years. Uh, uh, the uh, slide that you see here demonstrates in a, in a conceptual nature the unique breadth of the industry sectors where hydrogen and specifically green hydrogen could find application. And that goes back to the point that Miriam and Neil made about just how unique Los Angeles is as a decarbonization opportunity. It really is not only is the largest manufacturing center in the country, but it really features quite diverse, as you can see here, and quite broad range of sectors where hydrogen is either used as a heat source, and that of course offers opportunity to switch this uh, uses to, to hydrogen from natural gas, or serves as a chemical feedstock, in which case we could switch the gray hydrogen, which is emitting CO2 in, in the process of production, to green hydrogen, which of course is emissions neutral. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, the, the slide here uh, uh, illustrates the dramatic opportunity to drive down the cost of hydrogen, and that speaks very directly to the title of the event, Solutions at Scale. Uh, as Mary mentioned, this transition uh, that we are undergoing is not the first one. We have undergone several in the history, but this is not only the first one that happens on the policy drivers as opposed to sheer economics. It's also the one that we aspire to execute in the fastest period of time. The previous transitions took sometimes centuries. This one we aspire to ex execute in 20 plus years. Because of that, it's really important to understand what is the cost reduction outlook and what we can do to make that happen. And of course, many of you know that there's a lot of optimism in the world with regards to the cost reduction on the production side, because again, Europe being in the lead on the hydrogen adoption just accelerated its adoption with the goals which were accepted as recently as last week. And that is what's going to drive that scale. That is what's going to drive the factories that build electrolyzers to get large. And that's what's going to cost of electrolyzers to come down very much the same way we saw it happen with solar. And no other place is better informed about the potential to drive down costs through policy support than California. I always find it remarkable that cost of renewable generation came down pretty much full order of magnitude in the space of one decade with policy support. Truly remarkable and probably faster than anyone thought they could. Applying that mentality, that mindset and that policy toolkit to hydrogen in our opinion is what is required to repeat our success in renewable electrons now with clean molecules. Let's go to the next slide, please. Again, to recap, why it is a great fit for California. We really do believe that not only it fits the project that we're developing, fits wonderfully with renewables, it really is the next stage of development of renewables in our state as we see it. It's also very synergistic with what the federal government is trying to do. And of course, I'm talking about the passage of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act last year where a very significant amount of capital is allocated to support of hydrogen hubs. Again, that is something which in our view, very few areas of the country are as well positioned as Los Angeles, because uniquely enough, we have world scale renewables within reach. We have tremendous and very diverse demand pool right here in California. We clearly have Los Angeles Department of Water and Power that leads the way with adopting hydrogen power generation. We have the largest port in the nation 
and among the largest ports in the world on a combined basis, Port of Los Angeles and Long Beach. And we have tremendous potential to decarbonize transportation. And as Mary mentioned, not only reduce the greenhouse gas footprint, but also to make immediate and dramatic impact on air quality, including air quality in underprivileged neighborhoods. So to me, the opportunity in front of California and specifically Los Angeles is truly unique. And that's, I think, something that's one of the key reasons why we are so excited about the project. And we believe that our excitement is shared in private and public sector. Let's go to the next slide, please. That excitement, I think, is shared in obviously media coverage of our, press, uh, of our launch of the project. We fully realize that that launch is the first step. A lot of work is ahead of us. I take a lot of inspiration in the way that the world responds to the challenges of today, thinking that we can move at scale faster than we thought we could. And of course, again, what I'm referring to is you see how rapidly Europe moved down the path of energy independence and decarbonization. We're talking about their LNG terminals that they need so fast that they're thinking now about time frame comparable to three years, which is way shorter than could be thought of before the events of last month. I think that we working together with public sector stakeholders can make it happen, but we need to work together. This needs to be a true partnership where we're going to travel the development journey of this large project in a very, very close contact with private and public sector. Next slide, please. The immediate steps that we have taken on development of the project are filing what in the regulatory vernacular is called memo account application. And that has been put in place. We are very much looking forward to input from parties and the pre-hearing conference, which will be scheduled at later date. Next slide, please. That's the end of our deck, Yuri. Sorry. Yeah, maybe I can, maybe I can wrap us up, and then we can shift um, to uh, shift to um, questions from the audience. So, um, when the announcement that we made three weeks ago, and this is what uh, Yuri is alluding to here, is that um, we filed an application to open what in the utility sector, uh, an application with the CPUC for what is called in the utility sector a memo account. And what that does is it allows us to develop costs associated with developing uh, a project application. Um, so the filing that we made three weeks ago really was a jump off a first step in something that's transformative. And there's been a lot of excitement on the potential for Angeles Link and what it can bring to the LA Basin. But, um, but we are in the early stages of this and look forward to the engagement with all of our stakeholders um, including the academic community in, in making sure that um, we develop this initiative in a way that makes the most sense for, um, for our region. So with that, I think, um, I think that I'll pause and turn it over Jack to you to take us to the next part of this agenda. Thank you very much for your presentation here today. Um, yes, uh, we have many questions that have come in already and uh, some that you have already answered as you were uh, in the background typing there. Um, one, of the, one of the major questions is associated with the degree to which um, one may believe that um, gas and clean molecules will provide um, our clean energy future versus electrons. Um, there was maybe a little bit of a debate about that, um, but maybe you could have a, a, uh, a few points that you could make with regard to that. Sure. Um, we've done a lot of analysis on this, um, looking to see um, the role that a gas utility plays in a net zero future. And um, we published the analytics associated with this work um, in October of last year. And what it showed us is um, to get to net zero in the state, and I think it's applicable broadly, um, is it's gonna require a combination of clean electrons sourced from solar and wind combined with clean molecules 
from hydrogen and renewable natural gas and other clean fuel sources um, to get to that end. Um, there has been some broader analysis, and maybe I might turn it over to Yuri, um, that, that others have done that really, and I think the question was in the context of, of broader the mix of electrons and molecules. Um, and one of the sources was Bloomberg, but I think it's closer to a 50-50 mix is sort of the view of that particular analysis. But let me turn it over to Yuri with some perspective on that. Uh, thank you, Mariam. Uh, you're exactly right. And Jack, thank you so much for bringing up this question. I think it's really a very important and foundational question and the question is this, how will our energy consumption look like in a zero carbon world if we were to accomplish the goals of one and a half degrees or comparable goals limiting global warming? I'm actually surprised that that question has not been asked enough on global scale, because to me, this is the foundation we should all build on. Without that, the coordination, we are not going to be successful. And I commend Bloomberg New Energy Finance for asking this question, we'll do modeling and answering that. Their conclusion was that the composition of electrons and molecules is, as Miriam said, nearly half and half in 2050. It is, to be precise, their numbers are 53% electrons, 47 molecules. Given that this is a 30-year forecast, we can all safely say it's half and half. Really important takeaway. Just think about that. This is the statement that we need to ramp up production, transportation, storage and distribution of clean molecules. Whereas I will say that to date, most of the focus was on electrons, which is great. And we've accomplished tremendous success there as evidenced by the cost curves. Now is the time to make that next step and to use the policy tools and everything we know and, and uh, drive the adoption of clean molecules at scale so great question. And then, as Miriam again said, we have done modeling for California, which is very much aligned with that. The clean molecules are going to be critical for reliability and resiliency, and they can work together with clean electrons as opposed to compete with them. Um, my colleague and friend, uh, Professor Steve Davis in Earth System Science, um, suggests that most of the system models that he is familiar with show a reduction in gas use um, going forward. Is that possible that you think uh, that would happen too? Like what's the percentage of gas that's delivered today as an energy resource compared to electrons? Well, maybe I'll start that off and then I can turn it over to um, Neil and Yuri to respond to that. But I, I think that that's a very fair question. Um, we see um, forecasts of reduction in overall uh, natural gas demand. Mm -hmm. um, but what we also see in our analysis is how the need for gas um, goes up, for instance, to support dispatchable power that you're going to need to support the intermittency of solar and wind. So I think the way we look at it, and at SoCal Gas, it's important to keep in mind that um, we, are a, uh, we are a decoupled utility here in California. In other words, um, the, we, we do not, our, the gas that flows through is a pass-through for us. Our focus is on the infrastructure investment. So the way we look at it is, is that um, the gas running through our pipeline system may decrease, although you know, you have to match that up with the BTU content of hydrogen, right, on volumes. I don't, I don't, I think that it's not quite um, uh, easy analysis, but the, the overall volume may go down some, but the value of the infrastructure remains the same and in some ways goes up. And I think that that's a little counterintuitive because a lot of times people think, oh, if you're going to use less, then you must need that infrastructure less. And the analogy I've come up with for those in the audience that are parents is, you know, as a, as a parent, you, you may get less sleep, but you need that sleep even more, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's how we're looking at the value and the importance of what it is that we bring to the table as, the, as a major gas utility in this state in, in decarbonizing. With that, let me turn it over, um, Neil, uh, to you. Yeah, I, I think another thing to really, um, I think is important to consider is uh, it's it's sometimes we conflate uh, the current electric generation um, renewable penetration with the energy system overall. And right now, the energy system overall worldwide 
is in fact largely supplied by things like natural gas and traditional petroleum products. So, you know, whereas I think the, the electric system will continue to have significant advancements with additional solar and wind resources and batteries, and batteries that serve um, you know, longer and longer duration, but primarily short-term batteries, um, we are going to need solutions that scale uh, across a much more ambitious part of the energy infrastructure than we have in the past. And I think, as Yuri said, we've made very impressive uh, gains, especially in California, with decarbonizing electricity. Uh, but you know, we also have very high expectations about resiliency, energy security, as Miriam mentioned, mm -hmm. especially with what we see in Europe right now. Mm -hmm. um, and we take for granted that energy will be there when we need it. Uh, but we need to actually model and build a system that will deliver that. Um, you know, we often say at the gas company, we're not in the hope and pray business. You know, we, we, we build for uh, uh, a system that can deliver when it's called upon. And, and that is on a very cold night in December and a very hot day in August. Um, but it's also being able to store and deliver energy across all cases that were called upon. And whereas I think it is important to acknowledge that the overall delivery of gases in clean gases or natural gas in the future will decrease. The peak load, and we need to recognize that people continue to want to move to California, <laughs> the peak loads for electricity and energy in general will continue to climb. And uh, so, so we need to plan accordingly. Uh, thank you very much for that. I'm going to try to go pretty quickly through a few more questions here um, because there's a lot of them right now. Biomass gasification and digestion can also produce hydrogen. Would these be viable sources for this project as well? I'll kick us off on this and then turn it over to Neil. But um, our focus for Angelus Link has been sourcing the green hydrogen from solar and wind where the resources particularly strong in the eastern parts of the state. I th don't think it's prohibitive to other green hydrogen resources, but that's been the focus. Neil? Yeah, I would agree that, uh, you know, at least part of the, the thesis for the project is to support uh, the policy goals of the state. Um, and so the policy goals of the state are clearly to look at additional uh, renewables, traditional renewable resources. But, you know, we recognize, uh, UCI recognizes through its work uh, uh, that there are considerable um, resource available with biogases. Um, and as we all know, uh, biogases that um, methane from various sources that do not go into the air, but rather get used in an energy system actually really significantly improve uh, air quality and also our impact on the environment. So I do think that there's a lot of exciting um, opportunities uh, nationally to continue to really push uh, things like uh, gasification and other uh, fuel uses to generate either uh, uh, green uh, uh, methane or, or hydrogen. I think they're mm -hmm. all an opportunity. Um, and I think that's have, something we that we have to manage change. those waste streams no matter what and uh, using that's them right. for a useful energy vector. I like the hydrogen vector, but some people say methane yep. too. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, but I think it's important to look at things like the Senate Bill 1440 that mm. recently uh, that recently had a, a significant step forward in that effort. And that really was an effort that looked at managing mm -hmm. those short term climate pollutants right. in a way that gathers energy for the benefit of people in California. Um, and, and helps the environment uh, and displaces traditional uh, fossil fuels. It's important yes. to note that they will displace fossil fuels and could produce hydrogen. Yes. Let me go to another question from our Vice Chancellor for Research, Pramod Karganakar. How can a project like this be designed and executed for future technological innovation? Um, so 
<laughs> well, 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 go ahead, Jack. What were you going to say? Say once it's in the ground, can you do anything? <laughs> well, I, I, I think I on that I go back to my point that you know we are we would be a first mover here in California with this green hydrogen infrastructure um, project. And even though there's a lot that's known about hydrogen pipeline infrastructure, we've got hundreds and hundreds of miles of it in the country in in all kinds of locations, including California. Um, it, it is definitely a prototype of it being green hydrogen and what it can mean for the energy system um, nationally and broadly. So I think um, I, I, we think that it is something that um, can be transferable, translatable to other jurisdictions, but we have the right mix of the right end users and the right kind of resource for the production of the green hydrogen here to be able to demonstrate it, to be able to prove it and then show its repeatability. Neil, Yuri, is there more you want to add to that? I'll defer to Yuri. I think he's got something he wants to say. Yeah, and no, perhaps, uh, thank you. That, that's a great question. And uh, I think, again, not only touches upon the topic of the event, but it is a really important one because how do we make those cost curves reality in the future? How do we gain confidence that what we see has happened with renewables will happen with hydrogen? And one of the ways I think about that the resource potential of solar and wind in this country is unparalleled. We are in many ways, I want to call Saudi Arabia or anything else of solar. I think we are the United States of solar, but the ability to tap into that is order of magnitude more mm. than envisioned by this project. And again, me, you know, I'm excited about the perhaps opportunity in the distant future to think not only about using this clean energy, reliable energy here in North America and the US, but perhaps export it to the world. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't that give <laughs> us and the world safety and security that we so dearly need? So from that, the large pipeline that is, uh, 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 that is going to uh, uh, allow transportation of those large volumes is important because the production technologies will evolve over time. We know they will. We know through our RDND program how many best and brightest technologies today are pursuing the ways to produce hydrogen cheaper with cheaper mm -hmm. electrolyzers and some without any electrolyzers at all. It yeah, is so very some early days. And Jack, yeah. please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So some innovation for sure at the endpoints. Um, and then maybe from your experience with the pipeline over time, maybe compression systems and such too, and valves and regulators, these could be innovated over time too, correct? Neil? Yeah, I, I would say that one, one thing that we do know is, as Miriam said, we, have, we as a society have been moving hydrogen for some time, but we've been doing it with a very specific purpose. And that has always been for, for chemical processes. Mm. You know, what, what, what really opens up new opportunities is what you know. What could a university do, or what could a, a, a industry do, if if the quantity of hydrogen uh, being delivered was exponentially higher? I mean, the the numbers of technologies mm. and industries and things we haven't even thought of yet uh, that might come from access to hydrogen, inexpensive hydrogen, mm. is really truly astounding. So I do yeah. think. It really presents an opportunity to, to advance technology, um, but but anytime you've had a, a jump in the access to energy, uh, you've you've all of a sudden created new opportunities to think of new new possibilities. Yes, and maybe okay. Jack, just put one more quick point on that. We all know that transportation today is the real cost driver. We all know, as I think Mary and Neil mentioned, that today. It costs more to transport hydrogen in many instances than to make, and that. To make it. But yep. by putting in place an asset that can allow low cost transportation, we can unlock mm. this world class resource. And then the production technologies can drive down those costs, and you will have low cost all in commodity to the customer at the end. Very interesting. Uh, we have a, a question from Professor Jim Randerson of Earth System Science also. Interesting project. How do you plan to raise the capital for the link? Do you think that bonds, shareholder, private sector funding, how much DOE money or federal state sources do you expect? 
Um, let me start us off on that one. And I'm going to start with the last uh, item on the list, which is the DOE funding. I think that that's an important part of what should encourage our momentum and sense of urgency around Angeles Link and other hydrogen infrastructure investments. So um, uh, as, as many of you know, in the bipartisan infrastructure package that was enacted in the fall, it included about $9.5 billion directed towards hydrogen and hydrogen hubs. And that's very real money, um, not subject to appropriations. And um, I think that, that that has created a lot of momentum, both in our state as well as other jurisdictions to have that support for investment. Um, and where we would see that um, likely, and we look forward to participating in the application of that with other with others in a collaboration, um, really to support the upstream and the downstream sides of this kind of initiative to support the generation of green hydrogen as we see those costs come down over time and also the retrofitting on the end user side for the hard to electrify sectors. Um, as far as the our infrastructure um, investment itself, that's really something that gets um, developed through the um, project application in the rate determination with the CPUC, um, how that's financed and the way those costs are shared. What I would say is that since the announcement of Angelus Link, we have enjoyed a lot of outreach from stakeholders that are interested in every aspect of this, including the financing side and ultimately how it gets paid for will get decided in the process with our CPUC, and I don't want to get ahead of that. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I understand how you uh, have to set rates through a very um, uh, um, long and uh, formal process, yeah, with the PUC. Very much. The standard that they follow is one where the beneficiary is the, is the um, pays for it over many, many years, and a lot of times 50, 60 years, um, okay. but that's, that's the process. Um, we have a question from um, our energy manager, Matt Gudorf. I believe SoCal Gas is traditionally a storage, transportation, and delivery business. Is there any interest in expanding beyond that role to the hydrogen production, electric generation, or other aspects of the hydrogen economy? I love that vision. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to say we'll see. Right now, we have our hands full in doing the part that we think is really important with Angelus Link, supporting the hydrogen economy in California. Um, in the work that we did in an initiative called High Deal LA, which mm. included um, which included LADWP as well as NRDC and um, the the um, GoBiz function of a. Uh, of uh, the governor's office and the Green Hydrogen Coalition, one of the big takeaways from that analysis where we were looking at how do you bring the cost of hydrogen down from where it is that it is to $1.50 a, a kilogram, um, a third of the cost, approximately a third of the cost was transportation. Mm -hmm. And so we think Angelus Link really is, forgive the pun, but the missing link that if we build it, that production and the other aspects of it, they will come. Yeah. Um, there's also a lot of regulatory issues associated with you being a producer, I suppose, too. Um, can I go? I want to go to another question, though, because um, Professor Eric Saltzman asks, how much hydrogen transport will occur in existing pipelines under a, the new plan? Uh, what are the targets or expectations for leakage as a percentage of total production? So I'm going to turn that question over to Neil, but let me just start by setting the, the frame. Angelus Link is a 100% pure dedicated hydrogen pipeline infrastructure project for the identified end users, the hard to electrify sector. And it's new. It's and new. It's, it's new. not an existing. It's new. Yeah. Exactly. It's new. Um, we have a separate initiative that we are um, also actively engaged to um, decarbonize the gas in our existing infrastructure system and develop an injection standard in the state for hydrogen. So that seems to be what this question is driving for. I want to distinguish it from Angela's link, but um, Neil and Yuri and the team are doing a lot of work on that. So with that, let me turn it over to you, Neil. Yeah, I, I, Miriam's done a great job of covering uh, almost all of it so far, but uh, Angela's link really is intended to be a, uh, a pipeline that would move uh, gas at scale. So really large scale. So this would uh, uh, not be uh, generally viewed as be using existing infrastructure at this point, but but that'll come out of the design process and the scoping process ultimately. Um, and so we we understand uh, when we do that, we're we're going to be looking at uh, you know 
the the kind of the safety and other considerations that, that typically go into um, hydrogen pipelines today. And there are, mm -hmm. as you've mentioned, there's hundreds of miles of pipelines that currently move gas. And we know it's important to consider the safety, um, uh, issues of leaks and others. So that'll be baked into the process of our design. Miriam also mentioned that Angelus Link is very distinct uh, in, in focusing on green hydrogen, hydrogen that's focused on the hard to abate sectors. Um, we are still going to be looking at some of the things that Europe and other, the UK and other areas have really uh, invested in. And that is looking at the value of the existing gas mm -hmm. system yes. um, for things like blending. Yeah. Uh, but there'll be two very distinct uh, efforts. But the, the intent is similar in that we are really looking at decarbonizing as quickly as possible the system. Yeah. With that mid-century mark is is the is the is the most important thing for the state to hit and for us to hit as well. Mm -hmm. uh, let me please end with a question from our the founder and the visionary who leads solutions that scale here at UCI. A uh, really interesting, totally supported by all the campus uh, departments and everything. Um, Dean James Bullock, he, he came up with this whole idea of solutions that scale <laughs> that so many of us are participating in. He says, would you mind elaborating on your views about the role of large R1 universities like UCI in shaping conversations around issues like this? What can we do as conveners, knowledge creators, educators, and evaluators in allowing us to make progress on decarbonization? Um, why don't I start that one off and then I'd love to turn it to Neil. Dean Bullock, I just want to thank you very much for what it is that you have created with these solutions that scale. And I'm going to see if I can get on the distribution list of the other events that you have on it because it seems like a great concept. So thank you very much. It's been great working with you in the past. Um, I think that um, one of the um, one of the things that we are actually have, have been working with UCI related to this is the opportunity um, to work with UCI to demonstrate a hydrogen hub um, working with the university in their own facilities. I mean, I think a lot of this, uh, we made a lot of progress with the first power to gas project that we demonstrated at UCI. And I think that there's an opportunity to build on that and with the other UCs. But I also think that um, there are important questions that we need to be able to answer to construct Angelus Link in a way that is going to be um, withstanding and be successful ultimately. I think one of the key questions is water. Um, and, um, you know, the uh, production of green hydrogen is, is combining that renewable electricity resource with, with water. And I think the progress that's already being made and needs to continue to be made on non-potable resources is very, very important to um, where it is that we're trying to drive to. I think that also work on um, uh, uh, combustion emissions of NOx that are associated with um, with, with hydrogen, that's also something where we want to really fine tune our thinking and, uh, and make sure that we're not creating a situation where emissions increase. We most certainly think that this can be designed where emissions decrease. There's probably hosts of other areas where we need the best and brightest minds, and we're very um, proud to have an existing relationship with UCI, and we only see it growing stronger, as well as the other UCs as, as we develop this project. And Yuri, Neil, is there more that you want to add on that specific areas that you think that we should be highlighting for as part of this conversation? You know, I would just add that, um, you know, the UCI is uniquely uh, positioned, I think, in a lot of ways to really lead the conversation about energy. Uh, and both from maybe for a traditional sort of nuts and bolts engineering and science perspective, but also from the, the issue of the social sciences. At some point, we need to recognize that the prosperity of our fellow Californians uh, throughout the income um, uh, sphere is important. And uh, we need and we can have access to energy uh, that, is, uh, uh, that is consistent with our environmental goals. Uh, but we need to, to understand how to do that, how to do it quickly, and we need the support of the science, traditional hard sciences, social sciences, to make sure we understand how to do this in an equitable manner and in a manner that benefits the most number of people as quickly as possible. 
Um, and we need to help our regulators and our state legislators understand the need to advance the ball. And I think uh, the credibility of the UC system is important and especially UCI in its unique role in the energy sphere. Well, well said, Neil, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that very much. Um, I think it really is those very difficult to electrify and decarbonize applications that most disadvantage people, especially from the pollution perspective, those things in the ports and in the heavy industry areas, right next to the big freeway corridors. I really um, think that a focus on renewable hydrogen is the very best possible solution for addressing that most important problem here in this uh, South Coast uh, Air Basin. And so it's, um, and, and there's a lot of science that has to be done to understand the impacts and to know how to best implement things on the front end and the back end and to make sure that we have great jobs that can support people in doing all of these things. So I hope that um, the university enterprise all across the board, right? Social sciences, humanities, physical sciences, engineering, law <laughs> can all contribute uh, to that uh, zero emissions future. Um, Miriam, thank you so much for being here and dedicating this time to speaking with us. Thank you, Neil and Yuri, for uh, joining and for adding to the um, understanding of this very important project, but also the vision for the future in which we can actually achieve a zero emissions energy economy. Thank you. Thanks for having us. It was thank our you. pleasure. Thank See you, you soon. Okay.